I want to start this video by saying that people have suggested I use dog pictures in my videos, but I've decided to avoid this as much as possible because as the name of my channel suggests, I have an aversion to dogs and that includes pictures of dogs. I don't like to see images of dogs. I think they look monstrous and disgusting. We all know how hideous and grotesque pit bulls look, so I'm not going to be including pictures of them in this video. And I will avoid using pictures of dogs in all of my videos. I'd rather use images that showcase how beautiful the world would be without dogs. Anyways, over the years I've done a lot of reading, engaged in a lot of discussion, and given a great deal of thought to the subject of why people choose to own and advocate for pit bull type dogs. There's only a small amount of research that has been done into this. A few studies link ownership of high-risk dog breeds, including pit bull type dogs, with criminal behavior and antisocial thinking styles. For example, in 2006, researchers in Cincinnati found that high-risk dog owners, including owners of pit bulls, were 6.8 times more likely to be convicted of an aggressive crime, 2.8 times more likely to have carried out a crime involving children, 2.4 times more likely to have perpetrated domestic violence, and 5.4 times more likely to have an alcohol-related conviction when compared to low-risk dog owners. The study also found that owners of high-risk dog breeds were significantly more likely to admit to violent criminal behavior compared to large dog owners, small dog owners, and people who did not own dogs. In general, high-risk dog breed owners were significantly more likely to engage in sensation-seeking and risky behaviors. As a group, they were also more careless, selfish, and had stronger manipulative tendencies. They also seem to engage in more self-defeating behaviors than the low-risk dog owners. I will link you to these studies in the description. But none of this research proves that pit bull owners or owners of any other dangerous breeds are psychopaths, criminals, or anything else. What the research does show, however, is that any particular owner of a high-risk breed of dog is statistically more likely to have the traits and engage in the behavior described in the studies. So we have a small number of studies that show only correlation. What's left now are theories. So as I have done with my video on mind-controlling parasites, I am offering a theory which, by definition, has not yet been tested or proven to be true, yet it's my hope that researchers will delve deeper into this subject and test the ideas I am putting forth. I think there are a lot of categories pitbull advocates might fall into. There are those who don't believe in kill shelters and they think all life is valuable, even the life of a dog that has disfigured or killed a child. A lot of these people are vegans. Um, there are also those who are simply ignorant and know nothing about how all breeds have been bred for specific purposes. There are the people who have no clue about how a dog's behavior is influenced by its genetics. They fail to recognize that because pit bull type dogs were bred to attack and to attack unprovoked and kill, they are far more likely than other breeds to do so. And then you have the fur mummies. They view the dog as a replacement or additional child. It's just a love bug, a meatball, and a sweetheart. And the, they will hear no ill against it, even if someone gets hurt by it. Um, some of them will protect their fur baby even when it has mauled their own human child. And then you have the macho pit bull owner. I'm sure you've all heard of, quote, small penis syndrome. The idea is that men overcompensate their lack of manhood by overachieving in other areas, such as bodybuilding, owning 20 guns, or huge raised trucks with airplane wheels. I suspect a lot of male pit bull owners fall into this category. The dog is a symbol of masculinity for them. It makes them feel more manly, more powerful to own one. It's sort of like a Napoleon complex. And then you have people who get off, I think, on being beast masters. The dog is an individual that they can keep under control. It gives them a rush to be in control of an animal that can kill a person. These are all theories that I have explored with people over the years uh, through conversation. 
But then there's another theory, and I think it's very important to put this theory forward so that researchers can test and prove it, because I really think we are dealing with an unrecognized and severe form of mental illness here, and it's ruining hundreds of thousands of lives each year and warrants serious study. I found an article on the truth about pitbulls.blogspot.com entitled My Theory on Why Pitbull Advocates Are, quote, Nutters. And I will link you to this in the description. I think it is a fantastic article that offers insight into the psychology of pitbull advocates. The author was severely injured in an unprovoked attack by two pitbulls and suffered countless personal losses. He found himself outraged at the system that enabled such attacks to occur. He wonders why the government isn't protecting innocent people from such unnecessary, brutal, and violent assaults. He learned there is an aggressive and outraged pitbull advocacy movement that influences government and prevents reasonable, protective legislation from being implemented. He turned to social media to interact with these people, only to realize that they felt they were the aggrieved party, even though they had suffered no permanent physical injury as he had, they had not lost the ability to walk or care for themselves for a substantial period of time as he had. They had not suffered large financial losses as he had. They had never faced years of legal wrangling to seek compensation for their losses as he had. And they had not lost their business as he had. The only loss it appears they had incurred is that people hurt their feelings because they were critical of the breed of dog they had chosen as a companion animal. And yet, he says, their outrage was as if someone had murdered their entire family. This disproportionate overreaction struck him as incredibly bizarre. And it has struck me as incredibly bizarre as well. I am likewise outraged that our governments are not protecting us from these unnecessary, brutal attacks, which happen daily. It is truly an outrage. And what is even more outrageous is that there are scores of people out there who are passionately and aggressively defending the dogs that are launching these unprovoked attacks on innocent people. They show no compassion at all for the victims and will hate you with a passion if you criticize the boxy-headed, bread-for-blood-sport beasts they choose to love. The author describes this obsessed group of people who literally worship pit bulls. He visited pro-pit bull websites that had posted graphical memes that had replaced Jesus on the cross with a pit bull, with statements such as, He died for others' sins. They were literally insinuating the pit bull was the son of God and was being unfairly persecuted. What is it about the pit bull that had elevated itself to such divine status in the eyes of such people? It didn't make sense to him that a breed of dog that regularly maimed, mauled, and killed innocent people and animals and was bred for the specific purpose of efficiently killing other dogs could be compared to what many religious people claim to be the son of God a symbolic, perfect human being who had never sinned in his life, let alone violently mauled an infant to death. And it didn't make sense to me either. The author writes, quote, Only recently did it occur to me the pit bull is more than a dog for such people. For them, the pit bull is a symbol. A symbol is an object that represents something else. For those whose lives have been forever negatively impacted by a pit bull attack, the pit bull represents senseless violence, unimaginable pain and suffering, a lack of freedom, and an ongoing threat to everyone's safety and security. But for those who worship the pit bull, the pit bull is a symbol of injustice and unfair persecution, unfairly despised because it is misunderstood. He talks about his interest in psychology and the theory that children who are raised in unhealthy environments are forced to repress, deny, or justify their humiliating experiences until they can be safely expressed at a later date. He talks about the rage children can feel when they are emotionally, verbally, mentally, physically, or sexually abused, and how that rage is pushed to the unconscious mind and often expressed much later on as an adult through dysfunctional and or antisocial behavior. 
One of the ways this can manifest, he explains, is through what psychology terms repetition compulsion, which is the unconscious drive to replay negative past events in the here and now in the hope that they can achieve a different outcome and therefore resolve the initial issue. For example, a young girl who witnesses her alcoholic father beat her submissive mother may grow up to be submissive herself and marry an abusive alcoholic and make every attempt to affect a different outcome. He theorizes that for some people, the pit bull symbolizes their unacknowledged childhood hurts and any real or perceived unfair oppression they had to endure long ago as kids. He says, quote, they come to view the pit bull in the same light they do their wounded inner child as an innocent victim, unfairly persecuted and deprived of the love every child craves and needs. In effect, the pit bull is a physical manifestation of their past childhood wounds long since buried deep in their psyche, and any aggression shown by the pit bull is more than justified due to the unfair and unacknowledged suffering it has long had to endure. In effect, the pit bull is them. It embodies everything the owner believes they are, misunderstood, unfairly persecuted, unloved, or unlovable, and justifiably angry and aggressive." End quote. So the dog isn't a dog to them. It is a symbol. They aren't aware of this, however. They don't know that they are making the dog into a symbol. But they want the world to love and accept their dog in the same way they craved love and acceptance as children, because the dog represents them, their inner child. He explains how over the years, pit bulls have been killing people every few weeks, and those attacks that don't kill often cause serious and permanent injuries and countless other losses. We're looking at 20 to 50 deaths per year in the U.S., where dogs identified as pit bulls are implicated in nearly three quarters of the fatal attacks. 77 people undergo reconstructive surgery every day due to dog attacks in the USA alone. It's 28,000 reconstructive surgeries a year, and pit bull type dogs are largely responsible for this. He says it's normal for victims and others to feel outraged over this. Outrage is a healthy response to such an injustice. The victims were previously unaware of the level of threat these dogs present and soon realize that some type of legislative protection is needed. Out of a healthy concern for both themselves and others, some people choose to speak out either in the media, in the public, or via the internet or they make videos like me. <laughs> These people soon learn that for quite some time, many others have also been trying, rather unsuccessfully, to achieve the desired protection and stand up to a hostile and aggressive pit bull lobby group. The victims and their supporters are shocked at the hostility and abuse they receive when they express their desire to seek future protection to prevent such incidents from happening again. It's truly shocking to us to be met with such hostility and abuse, shocking and disheartening. Many simply give up as the thought of experiencing even more suffering on top of the pit bull attack is too overwhelming. Some, like me, do persevere and work towards raising awareness, and they fight for breed-specific legislation that would ban these dogs from our communities. As he says, quote, this is where the pit bull advocates focus their unconscious fury, you only need visit any online pitbull news stories to see the pitbull advocates aggressively insulting and taunting anyone who dares disagree with them. It is not unusual for pitbull attack victims who speak out to receive regular messages of hate, abuse, and even threats from those who promote pitbulls. End quote. Yep, it happens to me all the time. The author wonders what pitbull advocates gain from sending hate mail, littered with insults, abuse, and veiled threats. He says it's not like his humble Facebook page called Pitbull Attack threatens to change any politicians' minds anytime soon. After two years of diligent and thoughtful work on the page, it is yet to see a thousand likes. Yet, it isn't uncommon for a pitbull on death row after a serious attack to have a Facebook page started to save the dog from euthanasia. And it will attract tens of thousands of likes in just a few days. 
Why does the public care more about these dogs than the victims of dog attacks? What do pitbull attack victims represent to pitbull advocates? Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how the pitbull becomes a symbol for the wounded inner child of the owner. Those who were unfairly treated as children find ways to repeat such incidents later in life in the hope of mastering the trauma and creating a different outcome. He says, quote, the pit bull comes to represent all of the unresolved hostilities the wounded child experienced, but had pushed to the back of their conscious awareness. Any attack or criticism of the pit bull is seen as a personal attack on the once innocent, unfairly treated child. Everyone else knows the pit bull isn't an innocent child that was long ago mistreated. This fact escapes the pit bull owner, though. The owner isn't consciously aware of how they are using the pit bull as a psychological prop to repeat past traumas in the hope of securing a better outcome and hopefully resolution to the pain and suffering that remains outside of their conscious awareness. Those speaking out against pit bulls come to represent the, quote, oppressive and authoritative force that long ago treated them poorly and didn't take the time to understand them and as a result, withheld the love they so desperately craved and needed. The goal of the pitbull advocate and their repetition compulsion is to get the oppressive force to come around to their way of thinking, to finally understand their point of view, and only then can love and respect flow between the two. If this is achieved, the initial trauma has been repeated, mastered, and in the mind of the afflicted, overcome." End quote. So in their minds, if they can get the other person to accept and love their poor, misunderstood dogs, then love and respect can flow both ways and there will be a resolution. But this will not overcome their childhood oppression and humiliation. He writes, quote, Even if pitbull advocates are successful in their attempts to convert those they believe represent their childhood oppressors, such pseudo-victories don't really heal the initial wound because the initial hurt, shame, and rage experienced as a child has been repressed, denied, or justified, and later displaced without the initial causes for such feelings of hurt and humiliation ever rising to conscious awareness, end quote. This means that before you can truly heal from the past, you must first identify where the pain and rage is coming from. You need to address the root of the problem, you need to feel angry at the right people, the people who did the harm, the parents or caregivers. They have been let off the hook and the resulting adult rage has been displaced onto a pseudo parent figure, in this case, those speaking out against pit bulls. They are misdirecting their rage. They're directing it at the victims and those speaking out against pit bulls when we are not the ones who wounded them. We are not the true cause of this rage. In the same way they displace their rage, they displace the blame. They absolve the idealized pit bull and displace the blame elsewhere, in this case, irresponsible owners. They aren't aware they're doing any of this. So what is the answer for both the pit bull attack victims and those that promote them? He says, only when someone comes to realize the deep pool of pain and suffering buried in past unresolved hurts and humiliations, can someone then rightfully experience the resentment and the sorrow such incidents caused? He says there are many reasons people don't want to blame their parents or caregivers as being responsible for their current dysfunctional behavior. Some of these reasons are religious and others cultural. It's easier to idealize one's own parents and childhood than to risk losing the love and support of the only parents you have. Also, to do so would cause a great deal of pain and suffering that many people aren't prepared to bear. But consider the alternative. You're doomed to repeat the same old abusive patterns again and again. As the old saying goes, hurt people hurt people. The only way to overcome the hurt is to acknowledge its true origins, express the long repressed emotions associated with the negative experience, eventually grieve the loss, heal the hurt, and move to a point of acceptance. But this process can never start if the individual can't even recognize the origins of their pain and suffering. 
He says he doubts this advice would ever be taken by Pitbull advocates. I doubt it too. But he asks that you be willing to remain open to the idea that maybe you are drawn to Pitbulls for more reasons other than the fact that it is a dog. The advice to victims of Pitbull attacks, whether they be the direct victims of a serious attack or the relations of a loved one that has been attacked and seriously injured or killed, or anyone with empathy for these people who is rightfully outraged, he says, quote, you are justified in despising and hating those that are responsible for what are obviously preventable attacks. And who is responsible? We can rightfully blame those who own and promote the breed and actively prevent society's reasonable attempts to prevent such serious attacks occurring with appropriate legislation. Once the cause for your suffering has been identified and the true feelings of how you feel expressed, you can then move on to a grieving process that will hopefully produce some level of acceptance. In the long process of healing from hatred to acceptance, it is probably best to avoid those who promote pit bulls and ignore their abuse and hostility and see it for what it is, a manifestation of their own past hurts and sufferings that have nothing to do with you, end quote. This is precisely why I have blocked people from my YouTube channel and refused to engage with them. He advises us not to allow the pitbull advocates to shut us down or force us to repress, minimize, or deny our true feelings of hurt, anger, and rage. If we do, we run the risk of pushing such feelings into the unconscious mind and at a later date, displacing the hurt feelings onto inappropriate targets, just as they are doing. He writes, quote, The victims of dog attacks have suffered serious and permanent injuries. Some have lost limbs and appendages. Others have lost precious children and loved ones. These are people that have experienced unimaginable and unspeakable horrors. To attack and harass such people or their supporters, all because they react normally to such injustice, is truly crazy. To act more outraged than these victims because these people have hurt your feelings and criticized your obsessive need to own a pit bull is crazy. To be unwilling to choose any of hundreds of far more suitable breeds of dog as a companion animal is crazy. To use an animal as a psychological prop is crazy. To want to own a breed of dog that has killed more people than all other breeds of dog combined is crazy. To want to own a breed of dog that kills someone every few weeks is crazy. To ignore, deny, and minimize these regular serious attacks and fatalities is crazy. To try and use propaganda to cover up the fact pit bulls regularly maim, maul, and kill innocent people is crazy. And that's my theory as to why pit bull advocates are nutters." End quote. He also mentions how he doesn't believe they advocate for pit bulls based on concern for animal welfare. This claim has never made sense to me either. Humans slaughter 56 billion land animals a year because they taste good. The majority of people, and that's not even counting fish and seafood, which number in the trillions. The majority of people seem content to destroy so many animals for a trivial reason. Animals that can claim to be truly innocent. So that's the theory. Like the author says, I believe there are several different types of people drawn to pit bulls, and this essay was the exploration of only one of those types. For the author and for myself, this type is particularly offensive because not only are they complicit in supporting an unsuitable breed of dog for society, leading to serious injuries and fatalities, they do it in good conscience in such a way that they believe they are holy and righteous and everyone else who opposes them is evil and wicked. What are your thoughts? 